Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Brenda. I'm a recovering lesbian, Hispanic, Catholic, alcoholic, drug addict, full-figured woman. Thank you and good night. Uh, I have people who tell me, you know, Brenda, you're just, you're crazy, man. Don't start off like that, you know? Because <laughs> cause if you start off like that, then people are going to, like, form opinions about you before you ever say anything. I said, they're alcoholics. They form their opinion on my way up here. You know, and I, and I started not to tell you. You know, I started not to tell you, and I thought, I'll just share my story, you know. I, I'm just not going to tell them, you know, and I'll just kind of watch what I share. And But I looked out, and I thought, you know, they look like a really bright group. <laughs> and I thought, no matter what I say or leave out or change or whatever, on their own, they will figure out I am Catholic. <laughs> Y'all aren't even ready for what's going to happen up in here tonight. I don't care what time you got up this morning, you're not ready. Es imposible decirles el gusto que me da en estar aquí con ustedes ahora. Le doy gracias primeramente a Dios por la vida que me ha concedido. Con su permiso, voy a hablar en inglés. Hey, you know what? This is not audience participation. <laughs> All right? And for those of you who don't know Spanish, what I said was, hello. Um, I'm really glad to be here this evening. One, it was just wonderful to get the invitation to come. I feel particularly blessed to be here and be able to share with the other speakers that are that are on, on the conference for this weekend. And I just want you to know that I'm glad I'm on Thursday. And the reason I'm glad I'm on Thursday is because I figured you guys could clean up the mess and they'll forget by Sunday. <laughs> so um, I'm glad to be here. I uh, I didn't start sharing my story with other people and until I was almost 13 years sober. I've been sober by the grace of God, haven't had to drink or do drugs to change the way I feel since July the 3rd of 1990. For the first 12 years of my sobriety, God did not let me look up from my tablet. So I didn't go to conferences. I don't know who most of you, I don't know who any of you are. Um, and I, when I figure out who you are, I'll be impressed. But I, I, until then, I just don't know, you know, and, and um, so pray for me. Um, and I'm not here because I know more or because of any other reason other than it was just my turn. And then when it's your turn, I'll sit there and you stand here. You know, it's just, that's it. You know, I, um, I have it on good authority that you don't know what you're going to hear tonight. Mostly because I'm the one that's going to say it, and I don't know what you're going to hear tonight. <laughs> I like to start off every time I share in the same way for the people who practice contempt prior to investigation. <laughs> because they, they're gone already. <laughs> they heard that opening went, I already heard that crap. Or turned off the CD or whatever. So, um... And I try not to cuss from behind the podium, but I was in San Francisco, and I got on the public transportation because it was how you got around, and a really drunk African-American woman got on the bus, and she said, she walked up to me, and she said, I'm Jesus Christ. 
Well, you don't, you don't want to laugh in case, you know, I don't know. I mean, what do you do? You liar. So I said, it's, it's nice to meet you. And, and then she starts to scream obscenities at the top of her lungs. And the only reason I share that with you is because I try not to cuss, but you know what? I met Jesus and she has a foul mouth. <laughs> um, I got a, I, I, I um, get a list of suggestions from people always, whether it's before I share or after I share or while I'm home not sharing or whatever. And they're like, you know, Brenda, don't, you know, be funny. Don't be boring. Be funny. And then I'm like, okay, be funny. And they're like, but don't entertain. That's not why we're here. <laughs> you know, and it's like, read out of the book. Read out of the book. And I'm like, okay, I'll read out of the book. Don't read out of the book. They can read the book at home, you know. And it's like, so there's no way for me to do all of that. So here's here's what you're going to get. Um, I'm going to give you the story that's given to me tonight. If it comes out in any kind of chronological order, we will both be very surprised. <laughs> you know, it's a difference between the chicken and the pig for a ham and egg breakfast. You know, the chicken is invested. I mean, I'll give an egg or two. The pig is committed. And I want you to know I'm committed. I want you to know that for the next about 40 minutes, because the, the play guy said, you know what, you better not run into the playtime. So um, we're not going to do that. Um, but for, for the next hour, I just wanted you to know I'm all in. All right? I'm all in. So what you're going to get... <laughs> my drunken log is three sentences long. Now, I don't talk a lot about what it was like when I was drunk and falling and screwing everything up because I'm assuming if you're here on Thursday, you already got that part down. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's been my experience at, you know, anyway, you know, just a lot of, um, a lot of people share a lot about that. And that's great because we all contribute, but I'm all in and I'm going to share three sentences. I drank at the beginning because I wanted to feel good. And then I started drinking somewhere in the middle of it all to try and feel normal. And then by the end of it, I was just drinking to not feel at all. I was four when I took my first drink out of a Schlitz tall boy. I figured I'd start at the bottom and work my way up. <laughs> I was four. There was not a lot I could get a hold of, you know. And I took it up as a career choice at the age of 12. I sobered up when I was 24. This is what 40 years old, sane, sober, and single looks like. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and I, I love it because I'm looking at you and some of you are not impressed. <laughs> You're like, oh God, that's it. Woo! Pretty much. I feel really good. I feel really, really good. And I should be way more nervous than I am. And I'm not. And somebody said, how come? I said, because I don't have to make it up. I already know it. I was there. Uh, I was 24 when I sobered up. Um, I drank until it hurt. And then I couldn't drink anymore. Everything about my life that, that, that I was trying to manage was unbelievably painful for me. I'm one of nine children. I have six sisters, two brothers, my mom, my dad, 23 nephews and nieces, and 11 great nephews and nieces. And most of those children have never seen me drunk. That's amazing. They think I made chocolate. Um, and and uh, I was born and raised in San Angelo, Texas. I just moved to Dallas two years ago. I was remember working on my tablet before then, and so I moved to the big city. I went from a place where there were maybe 60,000 people when we were all there to, I don't know, Dallas. There's a, a few more than that. And, <laughs> and it's, as it turns out, there were only two gay people in San Angelo, and we left at the same time. <laughs> Uh, 
I know they wanted to go out and change the population sign. Woo! <laughs> um, so here's what happened. I, wow, are we going to tell that? Yeah, we are. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay, so here's what happened. I graduated from high school. I was 18 years old, and life had been very, very difficult. I checked out at the age of four. I took a drink. I left. I decided, you know what? It's too hard. Now, tell me, how lo how hard does life have to be, and what has to happen to you that at the age of four you decide no more? But on some level, I made that decision. And by the time I was 18 years old, I would go to school to sleep. I was out running the streets. I was drinking whenever I want, living the life that, that nobody should have to. And I was in a lot of pain. And I didn't know what to do. A lot of things that happened to me, I, um, a lot of stuff that happens to a lot of us that happened to me. And I didn't know what to do with that. And so I drank about it. And one day... I went to church, and I thought, this this should be okay, right? It's church. I should be able to find somebody to tell this to, and maybe maybe I won't have to drink. Maybe I, maybe it'll be different. Maybe it won't hurt like this anymore. So so I did. I, I went to the church, and I, I, I met this person there, and I, I sat down, and I, I just finally told it for the first time. And I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and when we got done this person that I was talking to got up gave me a hug and then kissed me and I went oh okay I know how to do this and started having a relationship That went on. My drinking got worse. The pain became excruciating. I was, you know, I didn't know a lot about God, but I thought that was a pretty quick way to piss him off. And so I, I'm drinking, and I'm drinking to the end. And, and what happened for me when I was at the end was that I was in San Antonio, Texas, and um, I went up to the 13th floor of some hotel and thought, you know what, I'm just taking a swan dive off the end. You know, I didn't want to go out quietly, but I couldn't stay anymore. You know, so I thought that'll make the news. I you know I wanted to time it to be sure that it, they got there in time to cover it. And um, so I went up there, and it the, turns out there was a pool party going on, and I thought, well... You know, I am going to kill myself, but I do have a little bit of time. <laughs> so I sat down and started drinking with these guys. Now, I was really late to dinner, and the woman that I was with that was waiting on me called and said, Where are you? And I said, oh, Okay, I'll come down. So I grabbed maybe something like nine or ten beers. I was on the 13th floor. I'm going down to the fourth floor of the hotel. I get in the elevator. By the time the elevator door opened, I had the door, the, the, the drink that was in my little koozie thing and one more. And a bunch of empty bottles. I was alone in the elevator. Okay? That's how I was drinking at the end. And I got down to the bottom of the, of the fourth floor where I was and this person looked at me and she goes, I hate who you become when you drink. And finally, from somewhere inside me came this voice that said, I do too. I didn't know that was the last day I was going to drink. I didn't know that when I put that Michelob light down on that parking lot that that was the last one I was going to have, but it was. And I came back to San Angelo and I said, I'm dying, man. I, I said, I have got to go to treatment. I need help. I need help. And I found the treatment place in in the phone book, and I thought, this will be okay. And I went in, and I sat down, and I checked myself in, and the woman said, so tell me about your drinking. I said, it's doing well, me not so much. <laughs> and I started talking to her, and then I told her, I said, well, and what really happened, the, real, the reason that it got really, really bad was because I finally found somebody to talk to about this stuff, and then it got really complicated. And then I had to drink some more, and I told her what happened. I thought, it's treatment. It's okay. So I told her what happened, right? 
She got up, gave me a hug, told me to sign the papers, and then she kissed me. And I went, oh, I know how to do this. So I went to treatment and I got sober and they started taking me to AA meetings and I start, you know, and so I'm doing the best I can and it's just, it just, it's awful. It's awful. And I decided I can't, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. And I went and I drank again and I drank again for 23 days, day and night because I wanted to kill myself. I couldn't do it anymore. Everywhere I thought I should be able to go and tell the truth, those were the results I got. I wound up in Alcoholics Anonymous and I started to go to meetings and I didn't know what was really going on and, and I wasn't really happy to be here either and it was real important for me to let you know that. <laughs> and so I started going to meetings and I looked around and I realized that y'all did not have a leader. <laughs> I went home and I told my mom, I said, Mom, they don't have a leader. I said, and I think they're going to ask me. <laughs> so I started to go to meetings, and now I, had, I was, like, really confused. I needed your help. I needed you not to know. I was, you know, running for office. I didn't know who was my, you know. So I started to go to meetings, and I would take the newspaper. And as soon as the meeting would open, I'd open up the sports page. Just because it really, really pissed some people off. And so they'd share in the meeting when it was their turn. You know, if you're going to read the paper, obviously you're not ready to surrender to God's will and whatever, whatever. So the next day I'd take my headphones. You know? <laughs> now they weren't on. I don't even think they had batteries in it. That's not the point. The point was that I needed for you to know that I didn't care what you thought. And so I kept going to meetings and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, and I, this lady comes up to me. She goes, um, we, you need a sponsor. Very badly. <laughs> and we talked about it. Here's my number. She goes, call me. I said, when, when do I call you and why would I call you? And she said, call me anytime you have an idea. <laughs> now I was sure I was supposed to be offended, but I wasn't sure how calm I was supposed to be offended. So I, at this point, had um, had called a, a treatment facility because my dad was bugging me, and I wanted them to come get him. And um, <laughs> Okay, so it didn't say that in the ad, dad bugging you, we'll come pick him up, you know, but I thought maybe they could help, so I called, and, and they're like, why don't you come here? And I'm like, you want money, right? So I went, and it was family day on Tuesday, and they said, if if um if you don't have family here, just kind of walk around and see who doesn't have family. So I'd walk around and say, is your family here? Is your family here? So I wound up with some guy, Pat, somebody or other. And so I was, like, working out issues with him, and we'd never seen each other before. Um, and then on the last day of the family thing, the lady said, you want to go to a meeting? And then strange crap started happening to me because she said, you want to go to a meeting? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, get in the van. If you're new and somebody says get in the van, do not get in the van. <laughs> so I got in the van and we went to the meeting. And they went into the AA meeting, and I went into the Al-Anon meeting, and we're all doing the best we can. <laughs> hey, you know what? Y'all better not get ahead of me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so th that's what we did. And when it was o and when it was over, um, the lady gave me her phone number, and she says, "There's a meeting here on Friday. It's a women's meeting. I'd love for you to come." And um, so I I thought of a lot of reasons why not to go, and so I went anyway because I went. I was kind of interested to see what women alcoholics look like. Do you ever get those points where you say something and it's not supposed to be funny? So I went to the meeting and um, 
the lady was there, the one that said, call me when you get an idea. She was there, and the van lady was there. And um, when the meeting was over, she came up to me, the little lady with the call me when you have an idea. She said, hi, my name is Pam. She said, a bunch of us are going to go to the kettle. And we wanted to know, did you want to go with us? I wanted to throw up. I said, um, no. She said, okay, good, get in the van. Hey, but you, I'm, okay, I got a steel trap up here, okay? Because I said to her, you know what? I'm, I got, I have my own car. I'm going to meet y'all at the kettle. She said, get in the van. And I thought, what the hell happened to, hi, my name is Pam. (laughs) So we went to the kettle. I sit down. We sit down at a long table at the back of the restaurant. I look down the table. I see nothing but 12 white women. Woo. (laughs) Kind of a little difficult to blend in. I would tell my friends the image of the Last Supper went, woo, right across my (laughs) So I start going to meetings. I'm, I, um, you know, I'm trying to like not let you help me, and you know, and I have Pam's number and all this other crap. And and this woman comes up to me. She says, "Um, come here." She said, "The meeting's over. Why don't you pick up all of the ashtrays, empty out the tr- in the trash can, and then we're gonna clean those up." I said, "Oh, that's because I'm brown." And we're going to deal with this issue today. (laughs) So I went to the furthest corner of the AA room and picked up that big gold ashtray that we pile this high because we don't smoke a little. And I flung it the distance of the AA room. Cigarette ashes went everywhere. A newcomer in the back, yes! Yes! She says, come here. I thought, I'm, you know what? I've been looking for somebody's butt to whoop. I, I'm on my way. And I walked over there and I got this close to her face. I said, you need something? She said, yeah, we're not going to start you off with ashtrays. <laughs> she said, why don't you pick up the styrofoam coffee cups? I felt like I had been demoted. So I like started with the cups and I'm going to meetings and I'm taking the paper and I enrolled in college and I didn't know why and I don't know, you know, it's just crazy. One minute I love it, one minute I'm poisoning the coffee, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what I feel, I don't know what I want, I do not want what you have unless you're driving something really nice and then we could talk. You know, and and people were trying to help me, and I was trying not to let them, you know. And there was this guy named Pat there, and he had two years. And he's, you know, one day I had like 30 days, and I said, Pat, I said, there's something wrong with me, man. I said, I've been here for like 30 days, and I know about the stuff they're talking about, and I want to drink really, really bad. And he says, I know exactly where you are. I have been there. And if you don't want to drink, what you need to do is you need to sleep with me. I didn't say he was bright. I said he was in recovery. (laughs) So I went out to the lobby of the AA room, and I picked up the phone. Hi, Pam, it's Brenda. I'm up at the club, and I was telling Pat that I really wanted to drink, and he said if I didn't want to drink, that I should sleep with him, and I wanted to call you because that sounded like an idea. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. It's for you. <laughs> I think she killed him. I never saw him again, ever. 
anyway, so I'm going to meetings. I'm working the steps. I'm doing the best I can. I'm, you know, I'm running for office again. And, um, and I'm trying to fix things with my family. Um, my father and I had always had a very stormy relationship. Actually, there hadn't been a relationship. Um, he missed the part where he was supposed to pick me up and hold me. That part when you're four before the slits. And then he's supposed to look at me and say, you know what? I love you. I love you. You're gorgeous. You have such beautiful eyes. And of all the good little girls that God could have given me, I'm so glad I got you. He missed that part. He got the part where, when I was 13, he said, I'm sick and tired of how hard you make life for your mother. The day she dies, I better not see you shed one tear. And I'm going to edit the rest of the conversation. I see a little girl sitting in the front row, but it was not good. He said, um, not so, so much good things are going to happen to you. He said, do you get that? And I said, yeah, I got that. That was it. That was it. And, and then I was off and running. And I don't think we had another conversation after that, all truth be told. So I'm 24, I'm going to AA, I'm, I'm doing the best I can, I'm, you know, starting to sponsor women, whether they like it or not, and, um, and I'm going to a bunch of meetings, you know, because that's where they keep a different perspective from the one I have at my house. And, um, so I'm going there and I'm in college and, and, um, and I found out that I had to tell the truth. <laughs> Don't miss that in the 12 and 12, by the way. It's, it's, it's actually in there. Um, and what happened was that when my brothers and sisters needed something from me and I couldn't give it to them, I made that about them. When they wanted me to show up for their lives, when they wanted me to be present, accountable in my body, and I couldn't do it, I made that about them. And I made them feel like there was something wrong with them for needing that. I had to go back and make amends for that. And the way I made amends for that was that I started to show up for all the crap their kids were doing. I've been to way more violin recitals than should be required of any sober person. You know, I went to like the little Olympics, the special Olympics. I'd make banners. I'd run along the street and they're like, she's not so, she's, she's not drinking, right? In the, you know. My nephew, when he got his license at the DMV, when he came back, I had pom-poms and a cowbell. And he's like, oh, my God. I just thought it was a big deal. So um, so I started showing up for him. And, and I, you know, Eric, he's my nephew, you know, and I'd run with these signs. And it was great. And, and, um, and I'm going to school, and I'm trying to pay attention. And I don't know what happened. I graduated. <laughs> I'm a teacher. <laughs> I've been teaching sixth grade for 10 years. Why? Because that's how old I was when I started drinking. Those kids need some help. We'll get to that in a minute. So I'm showing up for all the crap. The morning of graduation, the morning I graduated from college, I went on a job interview. And the guy says to me, okay, you graduated high school in 1980 and you started college, what the, and I graduated in 84 and you started college in 90. What were you doing those six years? I looked at him and I said, you know what? I was busy. <laughs> I got the job. There was this guy, he wasn't real happy about that. You know, he's like, you know, the only reason they gave you the job is because you're a woman and you're Hispanic. I said, it's about time it paid off. I don't care if they gave it to me because they knew I'd eventually meet Jesus in San Francisco. I don't, you know. So I'm going to tell you something. They're, the only wrong way to do the steps is to leave them undone. Other than that, I got it covered. Now... Now, here's my experience, because the only part of other people's story I give a crap about is the, the parts that remind me of mine. So here's how I work the steps. We have two textbooks. It's in there. 
The questions are in there. The prayers are in there. The process is in there. The promises are in there. The hope is in there. The truth is in there. God is in there. Go look. Oh, see, I, I done, I done untucked my shirt. It's finna get good now. You gotta go. I was just finna get to the good part. That's all right. Buy the tape. I'll see you. Um, so, so here's how I work the steps. I get the book and I answer all the questions. I go in order. I read it. I read it with my sponsor. My sponsor reads it to me. We talk about what it says. More importantly, we talk about what it doesn't say. And, and, and we just work the steps that way. I try and tell the truth. I try and, sh- and be the sober woman I want to be. Because the rest of the time that I get to share with you, which is about 20 or 25 minutes, I want to talk about what it's like. I've been sober for 16 years. So I'm going to talk to you about the quality of my relationships because that is how I define whether or not I'm being successful in my life or not. I am proof to you that if you're waiting until you have money to be sober, it's going to be a long way, but you can get there without it. I got on the plane in Dallas, Texas on Wednesday with $6 in my pocket. Now, tell me who goes to Florida for five or six, however many damn days I'm going to be here with $6. We get out at the airport, it's $2 for each bag. I'm in trouble. But God said, that's not any of your business. Your business is when I ask you, are you willing? Your business is the answer, yes or no. Then the rest of it is my business. And I looked at God. I said, I don't mean to tell you your business, but you're down to two books. (laughs) I'm here to tell you, you don't have to drive a nice car. I read the books. It's not in there. You don't have to be the most popular person. And I want you to know why I came to Florida. I came to Florida for those of you sitting on the fringes of Alcoholics Anonymous thinking this place is not for you. I came all the way over here for those of you who feel left out. If you feel not good enough, if you feel like there's not a seat, I'm going to tell you not only is there a seat, it's the one right next to mine. Come on. Come on in. The water's fine. (laughs) Try it. Try it. Work the steps. Answer the questions. If your life sucks, I'll help you get a drink. I'll help you. But the truth is, is that everything I ever wanted, I have here. And I'm the kind of person that would really stand at the corner right over here and say, you know what? There's nothing here. It's not worth it. Go home. Um, but this is what happened. I told God, you know, I put, I've made a list. I'm in charge of my finances, where I live, and my relationships. God is in charge of Ethiopia, the cure of cancer, and world hunger. <laughs> Upon review... I realized that the areas I had put God in charge of were actually working out. I mean, I'm looking at the commercials. The kids from Ethiopia look really happy. My finances, relationships, and where I live, not so much. So I looked at God and I said, okay, here's here's how it's going to go. I'm going to go ahead and turn these things over to you about my money. I'm going to turn that over to you. If you mess it up. I'm going to take it back. (laughs) Now, I'm about four months behind on everything, and I don't actually have any money for you to start with. (laughs) However, I will be praying for your success. (laughs) About relationships. It would be really much more convenient and way less painful if you, if it was, if it was a, if it went from a she to a he, but I understand that may be stretching it. (laughs) And about where I live, I don't care. I just don't want a place with roaches. (laughs) And I turned it over. 
I went to work, you know, they'd, somebody'd send me a bill and I'm like, it's your lucky day. I'd write them a check and send them their money, you know, and, and before I knew it, things started straightening themselves out. I even had money in my pocket. Now, the minute all my bills were paid and I had money in my pocket, I made a really great decision. Thank you. I got it from here. <laughs> now, today, when I make that decision, I still get the same results I got back then. Everything I put myself in charge of turns out not so well. So that's how you get to come to Florida for five or six days with no money. It's very cute. The little treasure lady. Love you. Um, <laughs> I love her now because she came up to me last night. Can we talk? Okay, we can talk. She came up to me last night and she said, you know, um, we'll reimburse you at the end. I'm like, come here. We got to talk. <laughs> that at the end thing, that's not going to work for me. We're, we're <laughs> Let's do the beginning thing. And she's like, that's not a problem. So she gave me some money. It was great um, for expenses, which I'm going to have, as it turns out, because I didn't bring any T-shirts. I didn't bring any T-shirts. I own 4,000 T-shirts. They're all in Dallas. So I thought, okay, first item of business, just to wa not walk around naked tomorrow, I'm going to buy a T-shirt. So I go up to the lady over here at the table, and I gave her my money. She's like, okay, good. She takes my money, gives me the change, and says, we don't have the shirts. <laughs> Come back later. So if you see me tomorrow and I'm not wearing one, you know what happened. I'm just telling you, all the stress out of life is gone. This is the easier, softer way. You know, I, I came to believe that a power greater than myself, based on my experience, I turned my crap over and it worked out. Then I made a decision that I had once followed with action. What kind of action? Well, I started sponsoring women's. I take meetings to institutions even when I didn't feel good. I read the literature. Do not wait until you feel good. Just go. Just go. And I did, I started to do that. I followed my decision. I turned my will and my life over to God and then I pretended like that was a good decision. And I started to act like I believe I'd made the right choice, even though my alcoholic mind would tell me every night, oh, my God, have you messed up now? You know, my mind is not on my side. <laughs> Woo! It does not wish to relinquish control. You know, so like even now, I'm sober, through and through sober. I will wake up in the morning and my alcoholic with the other members of the committee have been up drafting memos. <laughs> I wake up, they've already decided, you know what, it's just not worth it. You're, I mean, if you haven't amounted to anything now, you really don't have a choice. It's not, it's not going to work out and, and why get up? You're going to die anyway. Um, <laughs> And nothing's happened so far. Nothing. So, anyway, I'm like going to school. I, I, it's graduation morning. I got the job. It's gradu I go that night in my cap and gown, and I look up into the stadium filled of people, and there's my nephews and nieces and my brothers and sisters. And they're holding up sign that says, She's our aunt. Yeah. And they had already said, you know, if you owe money or have something on your record, there's not an actual diploma in your holder. Go by the registrar's office. When they called my name, Brenda G. Hassel, I walked up there. And, you know, they move you like cattle, right, to get all like 5,000 people done in four minutes. No. Uh, I said, hold up. We're going to check this right now. <laughs> so I looked, and there it was. I was the first of nine children in my family to graduate. The only one that got to go to college. And I understand that the only reason I got to go to college is because my older brothers and sisters took their place in my family and made that possible. I got to see things that I would have never gotten a chance to see because those men and those women let me stand on their shoulders. So when I graduated, I had copies of my degree made for all of them. <laughs> um, so I graduated and I looked up into the stands where my father was. And for the first time in my life, I saw something there besides disappointment. He said, Whoo, 
that made all the coffee cups worth it. So I go and I start school. I get done with my first week of school. I'm teaching sixth grade hormone build, as I like to call it. Because <laughs> those kids won't bring their supplies, but they bring their hormones every day. And the Friday after the first week of school, my sister called, and I thought, that's pretty cool. She's calling to tell me congratulations on going to work for a whole week. Woohoo! And um, so I picked up the phone, and it was her, and she said, Brenda, I was going to call to tell you that we just took Dad to the doctor, and they found out he's got cancer, and he's having surgery next week, and you have to come over here to his house. And I hung up the phone, and I started to cry in the office. I started to cry because I was sober, and I didn't want to go. So I went over to my mom and dad's house, and they said my dad was in the back room, and I went into the back room, and there he was, and the room was a little dark, and there's two hospital beds in it, and he was sitting on the one across in the other side of the room, and I sat down on the other one, and I looked at him, and his little feet didn't touch the floor anymore, and, and for the first time in my life, he looked like a little old man. And a four-year-old little boy. And this thought came to me. This question came and it said, Brenda, can you do for your father what he could never do for you? So I got up from where I was and I went over and I sat next to my dad. And I let my knee touch his knee. My knee had never touched his knee. And I let my shoulder touch his shoulder. And I looked at him right in the eye. And I said, Dad, I was going to tell you that I love you. I was going to tell you that I'm not leaving. I was going to tell you that I think you're precious. And that of all the men that God could have given me to be my father, I'm so glad I got you. And my father started to cry. And he stood up, and I stood up. And he throws both his arms around me and sobs. So he started his treatment, and we went, and, you know, my father had never seen a DVD player, and I thought, what a way to take chemo, you know? <laughs> Throw in a movie and let's go, you know? And it was great, and I'd go when I could, and when I couldn't go, I'd go to a meeting, and I'd tell him, I can't go. I'm sober, and I can't go. Help me. Those are the two most profound words I have ever said in Alcoholics Anonymous. Help me. I don't know how. I don't know how to be a sister to my sisters. I don't know how to be a good daughter. I don't know how to be a good aunt. I don't know how to care about you more than I care about me. Help me. My father, um, in order, Brenda, in order, I can't help it, um, so I spent the first, the next, 14 years of my sobriety taking care of my mom and dad. I'm the oldest one in my family that's not married. And the responsibility for that lies with me. And it has been my greatest, greatest experience of God. I tell you what, I have grown up to be an educator. I have grown up to be a productive member of this society, a member in good standing of Alcoholics Anonymous, a world-class aunt. I have grown up to be a lot of things, but the greatest thing that's happened to me since I've been sober is that I have finally turned out to be the daughter that my mother and father deserved. So I'm, I'm rocking right along. I'm 12, 12 and a half, 13 years sober. By the way, if you're 12 and a half or 13 years sober, pay attention. The wheels fell off of it. I mean all four of them. I was confused. I was lost. I was desperate. I was hopeless. I was scared. I was all those things. To visit Dallas, Texas. I don't, I mean, I just, I don't know. I just went, you know, and I went to this group and, 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 uh, 
And I felt reasonably comfortable. There was a speaker meeting. So I sat down and they said, the speakers didn't show up. It's you. Let's go. And so I went up there to the podium. I said, I'm Brenda and it's, it's bad. I don't even know how come. It's just bad. You know, newcomers took off running, you know. I said, I'm, I'm doing everything I know how to do. I don't know what's the matter. I'm, I'm in the fog of recovery. I'm in the fog of recovery. And I said something that I was not expecting to come out of my mouth. I looked at those people and I said, and I don't care. Because in the fog, I can hear God's voice. And I can see you. And if all there is from here to the end is the sound of God's voice and your face, I am okay. And I got up the next, I went to sleep that night, got up the next morning with a set of directions. I am not kidding. It came to me in my sleep. I got up and I wrote those son of a guns down. First thing on the list, tell your mom and dad that you're gay. No, no, they knew, but they were about to get the memo. <laughs> and the list went something like this. Tell your brothers and sisters that you're gay. Move to Dallas, Texas. Uh, enroll at SMU in a university. In the nine-year relationships that you're in. Start school at the Perkins School of Theology. Da, 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 da. And I looked at God, the God of my understanding, and said, have you lost? Is the little girl gone? Anyway. Woo! Y'all know what I said to God that day. And God said, yes, I have lost it, and I suggest you start right now. And so I did. I went to my mother and my father. I said, Mom and Dad, I love you. I want you to know, I well, you know, I tried to tell my dad. He turned around and actually went to sleep. You know, that's how he coped. He knew there was bad news coming, and he didn't want nothing to do with it, you know. So um, I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I said, I love you. I have directions. I have to go. I've taken care of them the whole time I've been sober. I didn't know what was going to happen to them. Only God's voice could have made me leave there. I said, I got to go. Here's my list of directions. And I said, but I'm going to go to school and, 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 I, and I'm gay. And I just, I just kept, I kept talking because she knows the rules of conversation. And that once I stopped, she would have thought it was her turn. So I just went on and kept talking and kept talking. And then she looks at me and she goes, Brenda, she said, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that this is exactly what God wants for you to do. I want you to know that not only, she goes, I love you more than I love my other kids. And I love you more than that because you're gay. There's room in God's world for everybody. Not only do you go with my support, she said, not only do you have my support, you go with my blessing." I said, Mom, about Dad? She said, I got him. <laughs> so then I went and I talked to my brothers and sisters whom I love. Whom I love. And I said, I got to go. I'm going to miss you. And they cried. They cried because I'd been sober and I'd been present and I'd helped them with their children. And they said, you have sacrificed your whole life for our kids. Go. We'll miss you. And I left. And it broke my heart. I go to Dallas. I spoke at the conference. I was 13 years sober now. And nothing has been the same since. Nothing. Nothing. I had never been out of San Angelo. I went from San Angelo to Dallas. And before I knew it, in the last three years, I've been out to California four times. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Uh, you, that's what happens when you turn your will and your life over. It is not your business anymore. And I get to come to Florida and I get to be here with you. I don't know anything about that. I just know that this is God's will. So I, this, the phone rings in San Angelo and it's this woman. She goes, I'm calling about the job you applied for at SMU. I don't have any idea what she's talking about. I said, yes. She said, can you come for an interview? I said, yes, of course, I'll be there on Wednesday. So I go for the interview, 
I don't even know what job we're talking about. And so, like, I went and I sat down and she starts to explain the job and she goes, do you want the job? And I said, ah, I said, I think there's been a misunderstanding. I said, I didn't actually want to work here. I said, I wanted to go to school here. She says, well, do you know that if you work here, you can go to school for free? I said, are you shitting me? Which is, I guess, not the thing to say at Southern Methodist University. She goes, she said, no, I'm not doing what you just said. So I enrolled at the Perkins School of Theology to get my Master's of Divinity, and I start working there, and I start going to school. And I told the people at Perkins, I don't care if you know that I'm gay, because my mama knows, and it's all right with her. You know, I didn't, talk, I didn't tell my mother the truth to come hide from you in Florida. I didn't tell my mama the truth to go hide from those people at SMU. There's a friend of mine who gave me a card that said, Brenda, when they ask you what it is that you have come to do in this world, you tell them you have come to live out loud. Which I see some of you are not happy with, but I'm almost done. So I moved to Dallas. I start going to school. Well, you know, the word got out to the people I'm working for. They put me on a prayer list. It didn't work. And and they told me I had to they told me I had to quit school if I wanted to keep my job. God, it broke my heart. It broke my heart cuz all I've ever wanted to do was be ordained. And the only reason, I don't want a church, I don't need a church. The only reason I've always wanted to be ordained is because I want everything about my life to say, God is my first conversation. So I had to drop out of school, and I'm, I finally just left that job. And I told God, I said, I don't know what you want. And he said, I want you to go work for the school district. And I'm like, look, I paid back my karmic debt from Catholic school. I'm not going. So... So I went on like four or five interviews. They loved me. Nobody hired me. I got up and dressed for one more interview, and I said, you know what, God, I'm not getting dressed again, buddy. <laughs> if you want me to work for DISD, you better get your crap worked out because I'm not dressing again. Amen. <laughs> so I went, and I went on this interview, and the principal says, I have a music and art position. I said, I don't know anything about music and art. He said, do you want it? I said, I'll take it. So I started working there. I started working there in September. The kids had already started school. I started working there in September, and um, in November, November 4th, my sister called and said, Dad wants you. He's sick. I was on my way to work. I called work. I said, I can't come to work. My father needs me. I turned around, went, packed a bag, and took off to San Angelo. And I went there to be with my dad, and all nine of my brothers and sisters came home. And I would say to my dad, he was sick now, you know, and um, I would say to him, Dad, i got to go work. I said, I'm going to go work for a little while, and then I'll be back on Friday. It's 300 miles each way. I said, I'm going to go work, and then I'll be back. And he'd look at me, and he'd say, you know, don't go. You know, I don't think you should go. And so I'd call work, and I said, I can't go. And they're like, we can't hold your job. And I'm like, I know, I know, but I can't go. So I stayed in I stayed in San Angelo, and on Christmas Eve, my father died, and and I was given him his morphine, and we were all sleeping there, all taking shifts. We literally hadn't slept for I don't know seven days maybe, and and um and we were all there, and I went in, and it was 1:15 in the morning, and everybody except my oldest sister was awake. I mean everybody was asleep. She was the only other person awake. And I told her, I said, if you're going to stay here, you have to get over here behind me where he can't see you or he feel you or nothing. His eyes had rolled back in the back of his head, and he was scared. He was desperate. And I looked at him, and I said, this is it. We can't do this, man. And I, and I went over by my father, and I knelt down by his bed, and I put one hand on his chest, and the other went over his eyes, and I closed his eyes, and I started rocking him. And I rocked him. And I rocked him, and I prayed, and I prayed, and he could hear me. 
and I rocked him, and I felt his desperation leave him. And then God said, it was 4.15 in the morning, and God said, these are his last ten breaths. And I started to get up to go wake my mother because I thought she'd, I thought she'd want to be there for the last ten breaths. <laughs> and I thought, nobody should have to do this. So as he took his last ten breaths, I said each of my brothers and sisters' names, and then he died. My nephews and nieces, they're little, some of them, you know, little Gabriel, he's three, and Grandpa was everything. And he said, what happened to Grandpa? And I looked at him, and with the most sober place from my heart, I looked at him and I said, he had to go to a party. He's like, okay. <laughs> so we went and we made funeral arrangements and all of that. And I sing and I play guitar and I played my guitar and I sang and we did all that stuff. And we did all that stuff. And, and, um, and we're at the graveside and Gabriel comes over. He says, now come here. What's with the hole? And I said, we're going to put the casket down there. The train will come for him. It's, you know, the kids are never going to get on the subway. Um, I said, the train will come for him. Take him to the party. It's all okay, you know. And so he's like, I don't want to go till the train comes. And I don't know how to do this. So I go to AA one more time and said, help me. And I was talking to my sister, my older sister, a few days after my father died, and we buried him, and she's crying desperately. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I just keep thinking about Dad out there in the dark. And I got to tell her what you told me. I said, he's not there. He's not out there anymore. I wouldn't have known how. I get back to Dallas. It's January. School's fixing to start. And they, I have 18 cents in my pocket. I looked at God and I said, God, I have 18 cents in my pocket. Amen. <laughs> because, you know, now I've learned enough. Just leave it at that, Brenda. You know, he doesn't need your opinion, your editorial, how you feel about that. He don't need no crap, okay? <clears throat> So the phone rings the next day, and it's a woman from the payroll office, and she said, I have both of your checks here. And I said, there's a misunderstanding. I said, I, I didn't even work. <laughs> I said, the computer must have just spit them out. I said, I didn't work in November, and I didn't work in December. She said, well, you need to come up here then. I don't know. So I go up there, and I told her, I said, I was with my dad. I was on leave. I don't, I, you know, and she she comes back. She goes, these are yours. You both have checked, one for November, one for December. I said, I don't want to take them because I'm going to have to give them back. And I got 18 cents. She said, the people from your work donated all of their personal days and their vacation days, and they donated enough days for you to get two full paychecks worth. That didn't happen because I'm special. That happened because I live in God's world. <laughs> so there's this woman in AA trying to get sober. Actually, she's trying not to get sober. <laughs> I'm immediately drawn to her. <laughs> she's a teacher, too. And then she says, there's this woman who's starting a new school, and I'd love for you to meet her, and I think she can give you a job and all this. And, and I knew things were kind of going to the, the crapper in the other job. And so I'm, I called this woman. I said, hi, Catherine, it's Brenda. Nancy says that you might have a job. Anyway, I'm just calling, whatever, whatever. So I get to my other job, and they're not happy because I've been off of work for two months. You know, I just left and never came back kind of thing. And the principal said, um, we think it's best that you uh, sign up to be voluntarily displaced. Now, I'm not real bright, but if I don't volunteer, doesn't that kind of defeat the spirit of the thing? He said, we think you should volunteer to be voluntarily displaced. We don't want you to work here anymore. Now, I could have taken that personally, but that's not my business. 
I said, I need to pee. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, so that was a bit more information than he needed. But I left the, I left the room. I picked up the phone. I said, Catherine and Sprinter, remember me? I called you a little while ago, like a month or two ago. I said, this anyway, that's not important. Did you have a job? She said, yeah. I said, I'll take it. Okay, I walked back in there. I said, I'd like to volunteer to be displaced. I'm here with you on Monday when I get back. I start my new job. <laughs> <laughs> it's none of my business. It's not my business. I'm, I started going to Allen on two two years and five months ago. I think so too. And and basically, what's happened to me is that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me all the notes I needed. They gave me all the paper to write it on. They gave me all the tools that I needed. Al-Anon added a little bit of melody to all of that. Woo! It's pretty now. It's pretty now. I go to Al-Anon and I tell them stuff and they're like, woo! <laughs> now, we don't talk about other fellowships, so they don't know I'm in AA. That's not the important thing. So they're trying to figure out how I worked out all that crap in two years. So I met this lady there, this lady, I met her, and she walks up to me one day and she says, tell me what brought you here and give me just the cliff notes. So I don't know who she is, so I tell her what brought me there, I gave her just the cliff notes. And I said, and it's just, I said, I moved here and, and I, da, 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 I said, whatever. I said, and it's really good, life is really good. And she starts to tear up. And I said to her, I said, what's that? What's that in your eyes? She says, we'll talk about it later. I said, okay. What's your favorite color? We'll start there. She ignored me. I said, mine's purple. She ignored me. She hit the door, turned around, looked at me. She said, orange. I said, I love orange. So I had lunch with her. And I sit with like two Mondays ago or something. I had lunch with her and I sit down and she said, tell me, tell me about you. I don't know anything about this woman. I'm like, go away. You know, I don't, I mean, you know, I don't. So I'm like, okay. So I started talking. I said, I moved here to go to Perkins. I got kicked out because I'm brown or gay or both or whatever, you know. And I said, I just want to go to school and I don't know what I'm going to do and whatever, whatever. And she says, I think you should go to school. And I'm like, duh, you know, yeah, me too. She said, she said, I'll pay for you to go to school. And I'm like, who are you? She says, oh, I got a little art gallery or whatever, whatever. So I asked somebody who she was, and it turns out she's like the biggest art dealer in all of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, what are the chances? So I saw, guess who drove me to the airport when I came here to see you? That woman. Guess who paid the guy $4 for my bag? <laughs> I looked at God. I left Dallas with $6. I'm like, I'm impressed, you know. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that it's going to happen where God can see me. I am so glad you're here this weekend. If you want what we have, do what we do. If you don't want it, do what you do, and I hope you make it back. It's all here. It's all here. There's enough. There's enough here. There's enough of everything. It says all those who have persisted have found strength not ordinarily their own. We are here to report that out of every season of grief, when the hand of God seemed heavy and even unjust, new lessons for living have been learned, new courage has been uncovered, and finally, inescapably, the conviction has come that God does move in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. I'm here to tell you, it's just like that. I'm not afraid to tell you, it gets really good. You know, it gets really good in AA, and I'm not afraid that you know that. Start anywhere. Do them backwards. Do them in Spanish. Woo! <laughs> you know, I know we got to go, and I'm going to end with this. I'm just going to tell you all, when this is over, I'm going to stand right over there, give away free hugs. I don't care how long it takes. Don't be saying the speaker was stuck up and she was busy. No, she wasn't. I'm going to stand right over there till we done. This is what's beautiful. Still more wonderful is the fact that we need not be specially distinguished from our fellows to be useful and profoundly happy. 
Service gladly rendered, obligation squarely met, troubles well accepted, or solved with God's help. The knowledge that at home or in the world outside, we are partners in a common effort. The well understood fact that in God's world, all people are important. The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we need no longer be square pegs trying to fit in round holes, but that we belong in God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living, for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possession could ever substitute. True ambition is not what we thought it to be. True ambition is a deep desire to live usefully and to walk humbly under the grace of God. And I'm here to tell you, I can't vote for all of us. I can't do it for all of us. I can do it for me, and I want you to know I'm all in. That's it. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.